functionalities of the name node. Um, what are the main features of the data node? What it does, and also data reliability and recovery. Um, I think I have covered even this one too on HDFS block replication strategy. Okay, right. So I will just give a quick recap on this. Uh, the, the purpose of the name node, it will store that means the names of the files. So that is the reason uh, since it stores the names of the file and locations and all the metadata, this B1 has been named it as a name mode. Okay, like, and it's very, very important and core daemon of the entire Hadoop ecosystem. So name node will store the file names, also the locations, block information, and replicas information, owner, group, Size of the file, okay. Like, um, what else? All this kind of a metadata information will be stored in the name node. The all this metadata will be stored in the allocated RAM for the name node daemon. So, since it is storing into the RAM, okay, like it will allow you to faster look up for any of the data element available in HDFS. Okay. Uh, since it is store, storing all the metadata in the RAM, it also has limitations on how many number of files that you could store. So whatever may be the allocated memory, uh, typically for each file, it will take um, what do you call 40 bytes of information okay like in the name node um according to that one okay like they will uh, uh, calculate how much ram would be required for the name node okay like depending on the size of the uh, cluster and how many files are there how many directories are there okay, depending on that one like so they will allocate more memory for the name node uh, all the vendor softwares, okay, like so they will allow you uh, and also they will uh, inform the regularly how much memory that has been consumed for the name or daemon. I will also show you once we go to the uh, cluster, okay, like I'll, I'll show you sample uh, cluster administration, uh, GUI screens, exactly how it look like and all the stuff. Ecosystem, so we will the entire cluster will be unavailable and there is no way that we could get the information about any data that we stored in the cluster. Okay. So that is the reason name node is very, very important. And not only this, also name node will load balance the data nodes. Okay, like, and also it handles about the replication as well. Uh, data node, typically the data node daemon will start, will be, um, available in all the data nodes. It stores the data in terms of the blocks. Okay, like so block. It will be in the binary and that is the reason it will be called it as opaque um, blocks. And if we cannot read the a block, only the his data system knows that how to decode a block level data. Uh, Different blocks of the so same block will be stored in three or more data nodes for the redundancy sake, and also it will satisfy the replication factor. Uh, the other task for the data node is it will always send the heartbeat messages to the name node. Periodically, it will send. So I think for every uh, um, uh, ten minutes like that, it always sends some periodic messages to that name node. If name node fail to receive the heartbeat message from a data node, then it will be marked as a not available. And name node knows that what are the blocks which have been stored in the failed node, failed data node, and it will start the replicating all that blocks okay, like into some other nodes. Okay. 
So that is how Nimrod will maintain the replication factor always. <clears throat> if data node failed to send out the heartbeat message to the name node, okay, like after uh, after three attempts, I mean like uh, after three failed intervals, then the name node will mark the data node as not available or in the failed one. So it will simply find out all the blocks which were on the last node, and then it find out that where the replicate replica of the blocks also will be stored, and then it's simply instructed to copy the blocks from one data node to another data node. Okay. Uh, name node will not copy the data. Name node will just tell the data node, okay, like so copy this data block from data node one to data node 13 like that. So it's always, they will keep the uh, replication factor, okay, they will satisfy the replication factor, and they will make sure that that number of copies of the blocks will exist in the ecosystem. Um, block replication strategy. So this is the default one replication strategy as well. And in case if you don't have multiple racks defined in your networking, so it will allow you to define virtual racks. Okay, like so you could say like one to ten data nodes are in rack one and eleven to twenty in the rack two, like that. You could also define the virtual racks. Um, you could mark each set of data nodes, okay, like it should be belongs to some particular set of rack. Okay. So whenever copy of the block will be placed on the same Hard copy of the block will be stored on different rack on a data node, which is available on a different rack. Okay. So that is about the replication strategy. Now, okay, like in today, uh, I will go through the one of the example why this replication is really important. Okay. I mean, unless you see through an example, it's really hard to visualize the beauty of the replication. Okay, so we'll go through that example. Uh, meanwhile, okay, like uh, let me know if all of you are able to uh, hear my voice. Okay, like um, I'm still seeing some people. Um, some people connected, but I'm not seeing any audio connection for them. Uh, BBC is BBC AC, CAST Kakinada, um, VIEW. I'm not sure whether you are able to hear my voice. Okay, like if not, please reach. Okay. Um, some problem with audio, Professor Ken, because uh, uh, I'm able to hear you without okay. speakers, headphones. But voice is a bit low. Voice is a bit low? Oh, yeah. Maybe I'm but speakers near to are not getting connected. That's what I was just uh, struggling. Uh, system, sir, no change from my end. Maybe problem with my machine. Okay. So, Chakravarti Garu, are you able to hear me? What about now, sir? I am. My mic is very near to me right now. So, probably. Now, now, now you are audible. Oh, now okay. you are audible. Okay. Uh, Jane to Vijayanagaram, I think, look like for them, it's clear. I think just now they joined Universal College of Engineering and Technology. Okay, that's all. 
just give it two more minutes and then I will. Uh, I do have a four notes. So this is my first note. Oh, I'm not going to slide. This is my. This is my first note. Uh, where the colored box indicates a name node, and I do have three data nodes. So first one, second one, and third one. Okay. Uh, name node obviously it stores the metadata, right? We already learned that. So here, some part of the metadata, okay, look like below. So there are two files in the HDFS. Okay. One is called user Aaron foo and user Aaron Okay, there are two files exist in HDFS in this part user Aaron foo, user Aaron bar. The five which are numbered as one, two, and four. Reality the number would be like random generated number or it will be. Uh, like uh, 14 digits or something like that. Like it will make sure that like uh, all the uh, block identifiers are unique in the entire cluster. Okay. So here for just for the example sake, I just mark them as one, two, four. The, so who has three blocks of data? Like the blocks have been named as one, two, and four. Similarly, the file bar has two blocks, which have three and five. Okay, so name node obviously has only the metadata. So it has the file name. Of course, file name is user Aaron. Who is the file name? And location is user Aaron is the directory location where the foo file is exists. And it has the three blocks which are numbered as one, two, four. Okay. Uh, name node it not only stores the block information, it also stores where the copies of these blocks also exist. Okay. Suppose the block one. Where is the copy one? Where is the copy two? Where is the copy? Just in the name mode. Okay. Uh, for the simplicity, okay, like just for the, I try to fit entire thing into the screen. So what I did is I just set the replication factor as two. So our replication factor in this example is two. What does it mean? It will, the cluster, Try to maintain minimum two copies of the two copies for each block. Okay, let's see high level. So I do have the block number one. So how mm -hmm. many copies I do have the node one and I do have the node three. So there are two copies of the block one and the block two. I do have the two copies in the node one and node two. No block four, node one and node three. Right. So each block has two copies. Our replication factor is two here, which is clear, right? And the second file has two blocks, three and five. So and block five is in node one and node two. Okay, so all the blocks has two copies, um, and blocks have been randomly spread across. Okay, it will make sure that. The second or third copy of the same block will not exist on the same node. Okay, like so that's how uh, the data would be replicated. Okay, so now we have three nodes, three data nodes, and one name node. Okay, uh, now we will see that exactly how this two way of replication would help in case of the failures. Okay, um, suppose all the four nodes have been. Uh, up and running smoothly, okay, like so without having any issues. So whenever you requested the file user Aaron two, obviously name node will give you that block one to four, and the blocks one to four are available. Uh, typically, it will connect to the data node, okay, like and then it will get the uh, blocks, and then you get the data and everything, okay. So now we will see that some of the failure scenarios, okay, like so what would um. After some time, okay, like so, what would maybe just assume that you lost the connection to the node one? So the entire node one we lost that. So 
So just assume that like we lost the node one. Okay. Uh, we have only node two. Who is accessible or not? So file foo has blocks one to four. So block one is available in the node three. Okay. And block two is available in the node two, which is good. And block four is available in the node three. So foo file is all the blocks of foo file are available. And so there is the file is also accessible even though we lost the node one. Okay, let's assume just for um, maybe I don't know how to how to annotate on this. I'm not sure how to annotate. Down to the water, maybe the reason. Okay, like so. Access both the files because all the blocks are available in other nodes in node two and node three. So even though node one is down, we could be able to access both the files. Let's see that second scenario where node two is down. Like so, give me a second here. Insert here. So now the second scenario, let's assume that node two is down. And now I have node one and node three are available. Okay. So node two is down. So since node two is down, all the blocks which are stored in the node two are also lost. Okay. Let's see that even though node two is down, whether we could be able to access both the files or not. Again, the user Aaron foo file has one to four blocks. One to four of one to four are available in the node one. So we could access the first file. Uh, user Aaron bar has three and five, so three is available in node three and five is available in the node one. So even the second file is also accessible, or all the blocks of second file is also available. So even though node two is down, still we could be able to access both the files, right? Because all the blocks. Let's take the similarly, okay, like with the third scenario i lost the node 3 we lost the node 3 and node 1 and node 2 are available okay so since we lost the node 3 all the blocks which are stored in the now you see that whether the both files are accessible or available all the blocks are both the files are available and also files will be accessible or not. So first file is one to four. One to four are available in the node one and three and five. Three is available in the node two and five is also available in the node three. So both the files are available. So here, here the takeaways from these slides are exactly from this slide, two things. Is Having the replication factor as two I could able to last one data node out of three data nodes. So that means I could able to mitigate the risk of loss of thirty percent of the nodes by setting replication factor as two. If you set the replication factor as three, then your coverage would be like maybe 33%. So even though you lost 33% of the total data nodes, still all your data would be available or accessible okay, for all the clients. So that is one of the beauty of the Hadoop. So you could you need not build the entire cluster okay, like using 
uh, corporate level, uh, highly available systems. So you could just build the cluster with uh, uh, any off-shelf servers, okay, like which which are may not be reliable as high-end versions, but still, okay, like by uh, following this replication factor, the the software will make use of. If you set the replication factor as three, you could able to mitigate the risk of losing 33% of your nodes. So if you have the 100 node loss, 100 node cluster, even 33 available and accessible. So that is the uh, reason behind the replication. Uh, but technically, I mean, even in, even in the logically, if you see that, storage space than regular systems, that's true. But um, uh, uh, from the reliable perspective, okay, like so when you're saying, when you're connecting like 100 nodes or even like 500 nodes as part of a cluster, there will be a, always some reason, okay, like so one node may go down, one node has some issues, one node has uh, some hardware failures, some uh, uh, mount drives problem, okay, like some, Due to some reason, maybe it may not be uh, boot up at all. Okay, like so, it may not be accessible. It may have some issues, whatnot. Okay, like some power issue, some uh, switch issue, whatever may be the issues. Okay, like so. For the time being, okay, like but your still your cluster will be uh, able to provide all the data which is stored in the HDFS. So that is the main uh, from. mitigating the risk of losing the nodes okay so this is one uh, this is very very uh, important thing okay like to understand that and ever never set your replication factor as only one okay like so but if you if you set only one uh, for example um, uh, like for the same example um, if you set replication factor as only one then one to four will be there in node one but the same blocks will not be uh, copied over to other nodes at all. So in that case, lose this node one, losing the entire file data itself. Okay, so that is the reason. Uh, default replication factor is three. I never saw anybody who will set less than three at all. Okay, like but there are uh, clients who sets more than three, maybe five. Even I saw that some clients has been set as six as well. So it's just like twice the uh, default replication okay if you, if you set more higher for replication factor that means you have a more is it clear so that's how exactly like uh, uh, the entire hdfs has been designed um you could set your replication factor at a particular file level and even at the directory level. If you set replication at the directory level, obviously all the files or subfolder under that, okay, like we'll have that many copies, okay, at the block level, okay. So that how that that's what the replication is. Um, let's go to the next one. Um, Oh, here there is one uh, one other thing that I missed out. So we covered all the cases. If node one goes down, what would happen? If node two goes down, what would happen? If node three goes down, what would happen? All this stuff, right? But what would happen if you lose this name node itself? We can get. So here there is one more case. What would happen if I uh, if I lost the name node itself? In that case, definitely there is no there is no other node which stores the same metadata that name node has. Okay, at least in this example, right? If I lose the name node, I lost all the metadata. I lost all the information. So there is no way. Okay, like. Uh, 
uh, to get that what are the blocks related to which file so i even though i requested a user aran foo but i will not get any i will not get any, any information to mitigate the risk of losing the name node they introduced the uh, concept of having a secondary name node so what it does is secondary name node for every simply copies over all the metadata what it does is it simply copies over all the metadata which is available on the name node to the secondary name node so for every 5 minutes okay let it simply copy over all the changes which are happening in the metadata to the secondary name node so suppose if you lose the name node what uh, um uh, and whenever you restart the again name of course you need to secondary name node okay you make secondary name node as a name node or primary name node and then like you start secondary name node in other node okay like so that that how it works um uh feature called high availability so what it is name node so it has <laughs> metadata from one node to another node and it always be sync okay like so if there is any changes in the metadata in one name node it will simply okay rep, uh, replicates the same in another node okay like always syncs about the data um and uh, whenever one name node goes down okay immediately there is another name node okay like which would be active which will become an active and then it will able to add, um, address all the requests of the clients okay that is called a high availability feature of the name node okay. so there will be two demons running as a name nodes and one of them would be active another one would be so that is the purpose of the secondary secondary name node okay i got some i got a question from jane to vijayanagara minimal communication replicating means copy data between nodes uh, replicating means copy data between nodes okay like it's not data level always replication happen at the block level okay like here also that is the reason i am showing this diagram exactly like so file name is foo okay there is no copy of the file in other node okay the file will be divided in terms of the blocks and then each block will have copies okay like so one node will suppose block 1 and 2 or 4 so the block 1 the first copy of the block one is in the node one second copy of the block one is in node three okay first copy of block two is in node two first copy of block four is in node one and second copy of the block four is in node three so the blocks will always be okay like the distributed are randomly given to the nodes okay it will not follow the same order so that is the reason second copies of 1 to 4 are not in the same nodes so they are always distributed so it always follows the distributed way that is the reason um if, if it is more evenly distributed then you have the more risk to coverage by using the nodes okay is it clear so the data okay like but data would be replicated in terms of the blocks to replicate block has copied from one node to another node yes correct replication will always happen from one node to another node yeah that's right so okay like so uh, people would try to log into the edge node Okay, like because the last time I shown you exactly what is the edge node and all the stuff, right? So edge node people will log in and then a name node decides. Okay, like so this file has one to four and which node will go into node one? Sorry, block one, 
which node will go into the block two, which node will go into the block four. So the name node decides, and then no, name node will inform the edge node, copy, uh, copy all this data in terms of the blocks, and then go to the block, copy of the block one into this node. Um, but whenever you copy the, whenever the system or platform, okay, a Hadoop platform, copies the first copy of all the blocks, it will simply send out the acknowledgement. It will say that, oh, your file has been loaded into CFS successfully. It will not wait until all the three replicas are available. HDFS, it will simply say, your file has been loaded into HDFS. In the background, okay, like so the, from node one, suppose here in this, in this example, this block one, second copy of the block one might have copied from node one to node three. Okay, second copy of the block two will be copied from node one to node two, like that. So blocks will always be copied from one data node to another data node. They will not be copied using name node. In other words, data is not like copy from data node to name node and name node to data node like that. So data would always be copied from one data node to another data node. Is it clear, Vijayanagar? Is it a minimal communication in cluster? Um, I'm not sure what do you mean by minimal communication. Okay, like so, name node will tell the data node, okay, like so, hey, data node one, okay, you copy block one to the data node three, that's it. That's the instruction will be given by name node to the data node one, and then data node does that. Okay, that's what that's what it happened. Exactly, I do have the I do have the second slide. Okay, like uh, just to just to clear on that. Okay, so we have the name node and we have the secondary name node. Secondary name node is just like standby for the name node. Okay, like in element data information. Okay, like. Name node will store all the file directories and the files to block map, block mapping. Uh, some people would use the word chunks as well. Chunks or blocks are the same. Okay, like, so it depends what are the context that they use. Uh, it's the same meaning. Okay, and chunk to replica. So block and then corresponding replicas where it will store. So that information is all available in the name. Okay. And name node will always monitor the load and also the health of all the data nodes. So here, all the purple or blue color ones are the, all the data nodes. So there may be one, two, three, four, five, so n number of data nodes are, will be there in the cluster. Even though you have thousand data nodes, but still your name node will be only one. Of course, there will be another node where you have secondary name node will be running on. Even if you are, Enable the high available feature of the name node. So there will be only two nodes where the name node demon will be running. Okay. But you may have 2000 data nodes or even 4000 data nodes, whatever it is, whatever may be your number, okay, like the biggest cluster it is. So still, we have only one active name node in the entire cluster. Okay. Uh, how does the communication happen between name node and data node? Oh. Very good. Uh, name node and data node, they're, al they're already connected. They're already connected to the cluster. I mean, they're already connected to through, I mean, if you want to, it's just like a socket communication, TCP IP connection, okay? They're always connected. Like when you say like a cluster, uh, when we say the cluster, a group of computers connected together, okay, like that means if they're, Cluster. Okay, like it can it may be via uh, LAN cable or using the your network, okay, like TCP IP network, or it may be wireless, okay, like some whatever may be the mechanism. Okay. Just socket connection. Okay. 
block levels are blocks okay like the data node will stores the blocks so here even in the previous slide this blocks one two four five so these are the these blocks are nothing but physical files in operating system in your operating system level okay so that's what like stores all the blocks are chunks in os files okay how you store the data in your operating system in terms of files and directories obviously the same thing even here too so your blocks are the granular level or granular uh, granular lower level of quantifying the data okay like in hdfs okay so that block will be a file literally and that file will be stored in your os uh, whenever you start a data node, okay, like uh, um, it will. Suppose when you start the data node, obviously you tell the data node that okay, this is the name node that you need to be connected. Okay, and whenever the data node starts, okay, like it will see that what blocks it has, all the list of the blocks, and then it sends all this block status report to the name node by telling that hey name node, I do have this list of data nodes. Sorry, I do have this list of all the blocks. Block one, block five, block eight, block twelve, block eight twenty-eight, like that. It will it will send out and will update its metadata according to that one. Okay. If we add, I had another question. If we add a data node, how the name identifies new data node? Very good, very good question. So whenever the data node starts okay like the data node will send a block status report okay hey name node i am a data node 31 okay i have blocks 1 block 31 block 40 block 80 block 20 like that it will, it will send out all the blocks information to the name node and then name node will register that oh this is a new data node or it's a old data node somehow we lost the connection with the data node and then again it drops now available and it has this block name information and it simply updates its metadata okay that's what it does similarly if you add a data node it will does that one suppose if you lose a data node okay then name node will identify that for every 10 minutes it will send some heartbeat messages so for every 10 minutes it will say that hey name node i'm alive hey name node i'm alive like that Okay, like then name node will think that oh data node is available and then all the files and blocks available in the data node, okay, like it will simply uh, refresh it. Okay, like so, like that. So in case if you lose the data node, then it will simply name node identifies that because name node will not receive any heartbeat messages from that failed data node. Then it identifies that oh data node 20 is um, connection with the data node 20 is broken and somehow it, uh, you know, uh, we're not able to connect to that data node. So it knows that all the blocks which are stored in the last node, right? And then it will simply tell other data nodes which has the copies of that block, and then it will tell them copy over to some other nodes, like that. So this process, it's really hidden. It will not be visible for any of the users. Okay, like, but uh, 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 these are the demons, right? Data node is a demon, name node is a demon. Demon means it's always be running. Okay, it's not that I just start the process and then I shut down the process. Demon means will always one will continuously running. Okay, like so. Um, uh, for some of my clients, okay, like uh, uh, this demons would be running on 300 days, 400 days, unless if there is an upgrade. Okay, like then only we will shut down the uh, demon and then we'll restart it. Otherwise, it will always be running. Any other questions? I know it's a little bit um, uh, overall thing. Okay, right. Okay, if there are no questions, I will move to the next one. Uh, how we will identify that each data node may be, uh, each data node has some identifier. Okay, like so there will be a, 
number okay like that uh, the system generates this number whenever you start the daemon okay like then it will inform that one okay like there will be a, a small number okay like but uh, that is a um, uh, 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 number that internally it maintains but logically okay like from the cluster perspective you could name it as a data node 1 2 3 4 like that people would do like that only i mean they don't uh, give some fancy names there okay like so it just they will follow the number sequence data node 1 data node 2 data node 3 data node 4 okay like, like that dn1 dn2 dn3 dn4 dn5 like that they will follow the naming and similarly even for name node they'll say nn1 and nn2 like that okay the host names are the names of the machines okay so until now we saw some of the uh, functionalities of the daemons name node uh, data node secondary name node right so here uh, high level okay like so there are two types of the server roles exist in here in the hadoop platform okay like uh, the daemons which are related to the distributed storage of the data the daemons which are related to distributed processing of the data okay like so this is little bit older slide but uh, i mean the conceptually the both are all even if it is let, latest version also it is the same thing uh, and what are the data nodes or slave nodes okay like typically all your data nodes will be uh, will be categorized as a data nodes or slave nodes okay like so uh, people are not calling them as slaves anymore because of the uh, sensitive word slave so they always call the data nodes the data node is the uh, very regularly used uh, words to categorize all your data nodes okay because since data node d1 will be running on and in the master nodes okay like you have the name node and the uh, secondary name node okay so these what are the nodes which have been running these demons which are we call it as a master nodes and the processing side if you see the distributed processing side um, the entire processing which would happen in the distributed manner okay that concept is called map reduce okay and i'll give you more details about the what is this map reduce what is map what is reduce why it's called like a map reduce and uh, how it will process distributedly okay like that and the demons related to map reduce are processing related ones which is called like a job tracker okay like and then task tracker job tracker will be there in the master node and task tracker will be there in your data nodes or slave nodes okay so typically when you see that the, all the data nodes data nodes should have a minimum okay like a data node demon and task tracker demon okay uh, job tracker and task tracker these are the demons used in the uh, older versions of the hadoop okay like until the hadoop 2x version but in the latest when you use the yarn so this job tracker will be replaced by the resource manager and task tracker will be replaced by the node manager so one is called resource manager and node manager node manager because that will start in the node master nodes and it will um, monitor the all the jobs okay like submitted to the cluster we'll have more information about that one in the in the coming classes okay okay I think this is the time okay like i would like to show you uh, the cluster exactly how it look like so these are the sample commands used for the hd first command i do have the very uh, i prepared the entire document okay to list down later on okay like and then you could run all these commands whenever you have uh, access to the cluster okay 
So for example, here, um, those who are familiar about a Linux operating system, um, all the HDFS commands simulate the Linux command, Linux file system command, or Linux or Unix, anything. So in the Unix, okay, like here, what is the command to display the files and directories available in a given folder? It, typically people use the ls, right? LS. Given part. Similarly, even in the HDFS, so if you want to see the list of files available in a given folder, okay, like this, you can use HDFS, say DFS, hyphen, ls, and then all the options. R stands for display everything recursively, and if it, after ls, if you don't give any path, that means that is the you know, user level home directory. Okay, I will show you. I will try to run. Uh, 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 just give me some more minutes. Okay, once that cluster is up, okay, then I will show you all these commands how to run and everything. The second command uh, will be used. You could see that one. Just ignore his DFS, DFS, but after that, you could identify these commands very easily because they uh, look like similar to your Unix or Linux based commands. Okay, so NKDR typically used to create a directory in your local file system. If you just run mkdr and then path, it will create the directory in your local file system. But if you run hdfs, dfs, mkdr, it will create a directory in hdfs. That is only the difference. If you want to create a directory in hdfs, just add hdfs, dfs as a prefix and then you give mkdr minus Minus P is just like, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, preserve, not preserve. It will not comply even if this directory exists. Okay, like suppose here the slash test, um, if this directory exists, when you try to create it again, it will comply by saying that our directory is already exists. But when you say NKDR minus P, uh, that means preserve the warning. That P stands for. Even same thing, even in the Unix file system. Okay, like when you say mkdr slash test, it will create a directory and minus P will preserve any of the warnings that are there. And the next one, your file name and then the path. Okay, a put command has always two parameters. First parameter is the, uh, as the name indicates, put you are putting this file into hdfs that means you are loading this data into hdfs so if you want to load the data from hdfs so you need to give wherever the file name is here the file name is the input file and then slash test is the directory in hdfs so you are telling the uh, platform copy the input file that text from local file system to HDFS directory called slash test. Then it will simply copy the data from your local file system to HDFS. And if you want to see the contents of this test, you could say HDFS, DFS, LS, and then slash test it will give you the list of the uh, files and directories available in that directory. And now we have put this file, input file, under a test. So if you want to get that file, from test, you could say HDFS, DFS, get, test of input file. Uh, while getting the file itself, you could say, you could you could give the file name, what are the file name that you want, okay, like file from HDFS. I will run all these commands and I will show you. In that way, it would be much more clear. Okay. Uh, put and get, these two are not available in your Linux or Unix. These are only HDFS commands, okay. The next one is the disk usage, do which is transfer du. I think du is all uh, available even in your Linux or Unix. Okay, let's say if you add HDFS, DFS, it will be a disk space of the same functionality. Okay. Okay, I got it.
Okay. Um, maybe before I come to the HTTPS command, I will try to show you exactly. Uh, even though Hadoop is open source software, okay, like, but uh, Hadoop is a platform and we already learned that there are so many components of the Hadoop. Okay, like, maybe I can go through that after here and then I will come back here. Uh, just give me a second. I think uh, we never discussed about this architecture. So this is one of the architecture of the Hortonworks data platform. Okay, like so uh, even though Hadoop is open source open open source software, but it, it's really not an easy okay like to download the software and then run on our own without any support from external vendor. Um, as a Hadoop is a platform, of course Hadoop requires not print, not only one software it requires multiple components okay like so here for just example pig hive page hcatalog hbase accumulus stamp whatever maybe with like spark okay like these are all different software um, different tools available on the own version okay like you need to see that compatibility whether it would work or not and uh, another one is very interestingly uh, it's called like a uh, what do you call it? all of give you any of the security capabilities to apply on i mean in other words you cannot restrict by saying that oh this particular data is only accessible for a particular group or particular uh, a particular particular group or particular team or particular member so you cannot restrict that kind of a thing so in typically in army organizations, okay, like security plays very, very important role. Um, and security has authentication, creation, accounting, even the protection of the data. Okay. So all these principles of security is really you cannot apply just on plain Hadoop software. So that is it. Most of the organization, they would take the help from one of the vendors. So one of the vendor is called like Hotton Works. Is the vendor or the tool supply this kind of a uh, utility which will enable you manage the Hadoop software in much more reliable and easiest way. One is Hortonworks, another one is Cloudera, okay, like uh, a third one is uh, like Napa, okay, like even IBM has their own tool, uh, 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 Intel has it. There are around 10 software, 10 software vendors, okay, like who has uh, managing software around the Hadoop, okay. But Hardenworks and Cloudera and Napa, these are the three vendors or the who captured all together 98% of the market. So 98% of the big data market is captured by these three vendors. Out of these three vendors, Cloudera has major occupancy and then afterwards part of work, and then third one is the Napa. Okay. So that is the relation. They have their own software which will allow us to easily maintain okay like the software of these versions, versions of different versions of these tools and also it will be very easy to add a node, to remove a node, uh, to add 20 nodes, okay to remove all the 20 nodes and see all the logs together, okay, collecting all the together and apply the security related things on top of this data. Okay, like this, this vendor software will enable us to have all these kind of features. That is the reason we need to go through this vendor. Okay. Um,
let's start with the bottom like hdfs okay like you could see that all individual uh, individual uh, node so here you could see that from one to n it's been marked as one to n so that means i do have that number of nodes in my cluster entire the hdfs okay HDFS is called like a Hadoop distributed file system. We already talked about that. Okay. And then on top of HDFS, there is a framework called YARN. YARN stands for Creator. Okay. This is the short form for uh, uh, YARN. YARN will enable, will allow you, okay, like to submit any of the processing jobs on the cluster we saw that map reduce right any of the any of the processing kind of a work will be called as a map reduce so to submit a map reduce job to the cluster and to execute map reduce job that job is, will be handled by the yarn we'll see that more a bit early okay like to go through that uh, all the inner details about the yarn but i do have slides to cover that time. On top of the YARN, we do have the batch map reduce. Okay, like this is the map reduce programming. Okay, like you would write the map reduce programming in Java or Python or any other language. Okay, and then you have some a script based language, it's called like a PIG. Okay, PIG is a um, tool available in the Hadoop ecosystem. Okay, like this, where you will write the script based and then it will execute using YARN. Okay, like so this you, you just see that all these applications accessing yarn okay like even to connect the hdfs okay and similarly there is a high okay like it's a separate component called page okay like and then uh, it also has another tool called page catalog we'll see that whenever we're discussing more about this tool we'll see more inner details about that Similarly, we have the HBase, we have the Storm, we have the, any other tool, okay, related to that and all that kind of thing, okay. And some other features on the security and some operations thing, okay, like there. Um, uh, one tool which will allow you, okay, like to provision any of the new data nodes and to manage the uh, configuration among these nodes is called like one, one of the tool is called like Ambari. Amhari is a hot and works proprietary tool which will allow you to manage your whole cluster. Because of the it will try to to manage the whole cluster in an easiest and effective way. It will be GU based. Entire thing is so it's very easy and it's the most of thing is self explanatory. But I'll show you exactly how the Ambari would look like and all the stuff. And there is a scheduling component tool as well. Okay, like it's called like Uji. Okay, like um, um, so as part of this course, I think I will be covering MapReduce, Peak, and Hive. The first three tools that I'm going to cover as part of this course. Okay, and if you have some more time. Okay, like then I will try to cover some other components as well. But let's see how much that I can cover. Okay, like so. Uh, my first priority would be to cover the syllabus. Okay. And also there are some two things like Falcon, Scoop, uh, Flu. Okay, like so these are the tools also will help you. So, okay, like you uh, ingest the data into the Hadoop. Okay, like and then uh, you start your processing on the Hadoop related and all that So high level, this is entire, this architecture is called Hadoop data platform. It's more related to hot and work based. The reason I picked the hot and works is that, um, of course, earlier I worked for hot and work. Uh, hot and works is mainly, their focus is completely open source. Okay, like they're not, they don't have any of the proprietary tools. Um, some Cloudera has their own proprietary tool. Okay, they are not completely open source. They are more uh, uh, like a commercial based version. Okay, like they are hard on work. They are more techies. Okay, like it's all, all technical people, they like hard on work than Cloudera. But all the sales and marketing people, they like the Cloudera. Okay, that is the reason Cloudera has more uh, client base than the hard on work. Okay, anyway, 
So this is the overall architecture about your Hadoop, Hadoop platform. Now we will see that I think I already explained you what is the Ambari. Ambari will allow you to easy manage your Hadoop software. Okay. So I am trying to log in that one. And again, this is only a single node cluster. I do have only one node cluster. Okay. Everything is done. Okay. On the left hand side, you could see that all the services which are available in this node. Okay. Starting from HDFS. You have the map radios, you have the yarn. Okay. Remember, we talked about the yarn, about the uh, for the page, we do have the high, the base, the like that. So, we do have all the services. We could, if you see that high level in the summary, okay, you could see what are the demons which are related to HDFS. Okay. On the left hand side, I select the service as HDFS. On the right hand side, you can see what are the demons related to HDFS service. One is called like name node. Okay, obviously, we already know that. And yes, name node is yes, yes stands for secondary name node. We already know that what is the secondary name node for. And third one is called data node. Okay, so these are the three important data node, important demons which are related to HDFS. I just know like this is top, this is top, this is top. So let's start over. Okay, like so a, you click on the service action and then you can say start and restart all. That is also good. And then it will start all the demons which are related to HDFS. Like so, um, that's what this vendor provides. This, provide, this vendor provides software so which will make manage the how to platform or how to software much more easy. Let's, uh, we'll come back on that. Whenever it's got completed. Ah, now I am logged into that machine. Okay, wherever the Hadoop has been installed. So uh, here we have used a CentOS. Okay, which is Linux-based operating system. Okay, it's called CentOS. CentOS. Okay, CentOS or CentOS. Okay. People would say CentOS. Some people would say CentOS. Both are same. Now I am in the, I logged in into Linux box, okay, like, and then you could say like username, okay, like, so this is one, you could say like which operating system it has, sorry. Okay, so I am using this Linux operating system and what is the version of the Linux that has been installed and all the stuff, okay. So here we will clear everything on the screen and it will give you the empty now, okay. And you say like PWD, okay, like you give it the exactly um, directory where you are, where you are currently in, right? It's called present working directory. So when you say like LS, okay, like it will give you all the, um, all the files and directories available in that directory. So LS will give you the list of files and directories available in that given directory. I'm talking about Unix commands here. Unix or Linux commands, okay? LS will give you the list of files and everything. Those who are already uh, uh, those who are already familiar about Linux or Unix, so you know that what I'm typing here, right? Uh, some people are requesting me zoom in. Oh, not sure how to how I can zoom. Okay, I could say. Make text as bigger, okay, like 
is it better now uh jayanti vijayanagar is it better okay sir uh, and of course I... if you can make it still that is better but this is okay okay yes sir next one uh, <coughs> so have some okay i created a directory okay like a called class underscore local here the local indicates um, this is my present working directory local means it is available in the files are existing all the files if you are whatever the files are showing okay these are exist in the local operating system okay also uh, let me go back one more time okay like pwd and then uh, now say we will really give it or are you able to send it how is it now Yeah, some for zoom in function is you could also zoom in on your end. Okay, like so on the WebEx option, maybe you could also do that really. if it is not visible or something you could also do yeah you could also have an option or okay, like to zoom it on yourself from on your end yeah i think now it's now it's much more better hello yes you have the zoom option on the right side you have zoom in and zoom out options when you click on zoom in you can very clearly see this comfortably okay so now all these files are in local okay like i that is the reason i named it as a class underscore local because i created directory the local operating system So you could say simply mkdr minus p, okay, like um, class local. Okay, so it will simply try to create the folder if it is not exposed. If it is there, ah, uh -huh. I think I created it wrong. So mkdr minus p, and then we could say like a class local. Okay, and go to the class local. I will. I added some other files here. Okay, like for example, uh, you could say uh, Chicago dot text. Okay, which will give you and what is the size of the file. Okay, typical is anyway. Uh, this is not a Linux or Unix class, so I need not go to the details about that one. But I'm just showing you this Chicago dot text file is in. your local operating system let's try to put this file into hdfs the far i'm trying to begin okay and let's see if it makes you let it be have any option let's create a new directory i'm typing one more time just tell us okay here uh let's say we have a class like that so here i don't have any directory here right i have only the directory called wizy everything is in local file system so let's go ahead and create a directory in hdfs so if you want to create a directory in hdfs hdfs dfs and kdfs maybe i could 
I'll show you local first and then let's go further. mkdr minus p and test. Okay. I created a directory in local and then I got it as a test here. Because I mkdr minus p will be the we created directory in local file system. Similarly, we'll create a directory in HDFS. mkdr minus p. I would say slash test. Okay. Yeah. ELS is a command used for the local file system. So use HDFS, DFS, ELS, and then test. Oh, I just have already, I just have already that directory exists. Already. Let's create something called test JNT. Okay. I created another folder in HDFS called slash test underscore JNT. Similar to your local file system, even HDFS also starts with slash or root. Okay. Uh, here, test JNT. I just created a new folder and if it is empty because we don't have any files in test underscore JNT. Okay. Where is this test underscore JNT? It is not in local here. This directory you created in HDFS. How to see the contents of the HDFS? You need to run a command which will display the contents of HDFS files. So to, to get that, you need to view HDFS, DFS, LS, and also you could say slash. It will view all the directories available in the slash. Then you can see that where is this test underscore JNT. So here test underscore JNT. So these, these files are not in your local file system. These are in HDFS. So where is that? If you want to see that one, you need to run HDFS, DFS command. That is the reason I'm running both. You can understand in better way. You know that what is the difference between, where is this data? How, do you, how you are getting that? Okay. Uh, Professor, and a small query. Yeah, sure. Uh, the thing is fine. You have shown both the local file system as well as the HDFS file system. That is the logical bifurcation. But even the files that are in HDFS are also local on the machine. Their physical existence. Some of them could be there and another not. I agree. No, uh, again, that it will not be stored in terms of the files. In HDFS, always it is stored in terms of the blocks. No, no. Uh, I, yes, yes, of course, I agree with you. Let us suppose I transformed, uh, rather I transferred your Chicago.txt that is there on your local host. I transfer it to the HDFS file system. Mm -hmm. Then what happens? That will be made into blocks. Let us suppose the size of the Chicago dot text is 500 MB. Okay. So 64 MB is a block. Let us say it is 640 MB. So it okay. is 10 blocks size file. Correct. And once you divide that into 10 blocks and transform into HDFS, then it need not store all the blocks on the same node but here they are physically there on the same node so how does it happen if i want to transform that is one doubt i have yeah we will we'll go through that same example okay, okay, like, okay. so here i have <laughs> it also that here. What I, do, I will try to transfer this file into okay like hdfs directory i will Copy or you could say copy, load, or people try to use the put only because the command they use as put. So, chicago.txt file, and then you give your HDFS part. The second command, the, this one, this command has not given any results because there is no data in test underscore jnt directory in HDFS. 
so now we are trying to add this chicago.txt file into the directory And then you try to run the same command afterwards. So now you saw, now you see that Chicago text file is available. Of course, it's not a, a very big file. Okay, like so. It has 130 kilobytes. Okay, like obviously since it's less than 64 megabytes, okay, like it will be entire this file will be storing only one block. Okay. Um, here the professor question is how to see that where these blocks have been stored. Is it is it right or shifted to that? Now uh, is it the same physical file referred by HDFS as well as local file system or no. a copy is there? No, a copy will be copied to the HDFS. Okay, like so always when you say like put uh, the copy of the Chicago text file will be more into the HDFS. Then there is no link in between local file and here. Link is already broken. Uh, it's simply copy. Okay, it's copy of file. Okay, like so. And again. Karan, like, excuse me. Karan, hello? Karan, excuse me. Can, can you enlarge the font size? Uh, command font size? Uh, you have one uh, zoom option. On sir, your no. screen itself, that on is comfortable it. zooming you, sir. Uh, uh, bother about how where these blocks have been stored, but I will explain that where it will be stored and all the stuff. But technically, okay, like the users who are using the Hadoop, they need not worry about where this um, blocks, how it will be divided in terms of the block, how it's been distributed to different nodes, and. Uh, um, uh, where can we see this block level information and all this? That all the entire that is all um, functionality is built in as part of the platform. But if you want to see, okay, like so. Yes, of course, I agree with that. But still, okay. just out of curiosity. When you say like uh, when you go to that some configuration, so data node directories. So this is a this is the directory. <coughs> the data node which stores all the block level information. So, for example, here it's been configured as slash Hadoop slash HDFS slash data. So, what you need to do is, okay, like go to here and paste that. Then you could say like current and then here this is. So, BP, whatever it is, okay, like it's one. And similarly, you can go to version. So this is nothing but this is one of the one. And something like that. So still we there something like called finalized. Then subdirectory. Okay. And then stick the subdirectory. Okay, so here in the, inside this directory, we have all the block level and then metadata. So all these block level blocks have been has a identifier, so blk underscore and then some identifier. It's called like block. This is how uh, entire of all the files will be stored in terms of the blocks. Again, all these blocks will be on the local file system. And here the name node directory. This is the directory where name node will store metadata okay, like so for every frequent time interval okay like name node spits out all the metadata from the ram and then it is stores in terms of the file okay like edit file and there are two type, two different files that it stores all the information okay you could have the multiple directories here not only one and you could have you could configure like more than one so in that way okay like so it, it always um, uh, follows a round robin fashion, okay, like when storing the block block IDs as well. Um, in the typically in uh, any of the clients, um, so we'll configure more than one, more than ten, like that. So because most of the time, if you have a drive, there is a chance that the entire drive would go wrong. So right, like I mean, the entire the disk 
may not be available and that this may be corrupted and that the drive may go wrong. Okay, like so that is the reason. Uh, we'll have multiple of these connected and then like uh, we'll configure uh, all the different directories or different mode points so that like each block will be distributed uh, in a round driving fashion. So this is the directory uh, Okay, let's come back to our HDFS commands. So, okay, like, so we already learned test underscore jmpu. Okay, let's uh, LSR will give you all the uh, files recursively under the directory. Okay. Um, Sample commands like how to play around with HDFS. I will send across the entire list, and you guys will practice even later on. Uh, how to see what are the what are the options available? Okay, like in HDFS. So one of the beauty thing is just type HDFS and slash DFS and then enter. Okay, it will give you all the options. So here, for example, append to file, cat, checksum, change group, change mod, change modify the permission. Copy, create snapshot like this, all the different commands with their uses will be available. Just you need to type HDFS, DFS, and enter. Again, HDFS stands for HDFS file system, and DFS stands for distributed file system. So, all the file levels, um, file system level commands okay, will be available as part of the option. Okay. Even if you enter HDFS and then enter, it will give you options are available after HDFS. So you have a data node, you have DFS admin, HA admin, like that you do have a lot of things here. So this is the DFS is the one which we tried. All of all the file systems commands are under DFS. Okay. So that is how you need to know what are the different options are available. Of course, you could also give HDFS, DFS help as well. Okay, like it will give you more, more, uh, much more information about all the options of each command and what would be their usage and what is the. It's just like a manual. Okay, like in the Linux command, when you select man of man of command, it will give you all the manual or guidelines. Okay, how to use the command similarly. Covered HDFS, covered on the architecture, okay, like so. Um, um, yeah, this is like uh, this is the like a stepping one on on the uh, how to platform, okay, like so. Now, um, even if I can explain something about map reduce or anything, then you could be able to understand it very clearly, okay, like so. I think still I do have 15 more minutes. Okay, like so quickly. Um, uh, uh, high level, I will explain about what is MapReduce, and then by next from next class onwards, uh, I will start the Java related stuff, and then we will be covering Unit One of part of Unit Two is already uh, already covered, so we'll see that. What else is pending after the unit two, and then we go from unit three and four. Um, yeah, uh, in the slide, what are things that I have shown in the commands? Okay, like you could also give a try. Also, I will uh, uh, send you all the uh, command guide as well. Complete idea of 30 different commands uh, with all the examples. Okay, like uh, you could run very easily there. Uh, map reduce. <laughs> what is map reduce? We will see about that, and I will give you a very nice example. And with that, it will be very very clear. Uh, maybe I can show some notes. Okay, I don't have anything here.
uh, the example if i explain to this is some example that will be that will give you is what is not like by the way so let's job okay so this job is about you need to count or you need to identify frequency of words in a given book okay so this is my job you need to identify that how many words are there used in this book and each word how many times it has been used in other words this will be very simply uh, people would be called as a word count okay so we need to have each word and then how many times it has been repeated or what is the frequency of the word used in that book high level let's assume this book has 1000 pages so if you want to do manually let's take 10 minutes to complete a single page okay. so the book has 1000 pages and if i give this job to a person he will take an average of 10 minutes single page so the total time to count all the words in that book by a single person how many minutes uh, let's cut down this 100 pages and so that like i will have the 1000 minutes right so each page 10 minutes so 100 multiplied by 10 which is nothing but 1000 minutes all right is it clear this not every row i do have a book how 100 pages so each page to count the words and then frequency corresponding frequency it will take 10 minutes so to compute the words in the entire book obviously need 1000 minutes right is it clear everyone so now we will see that how we will run this job in a distributed manner okay how we could divide this task or job into several tasks for example if i have only single person if i want to do myself for okay, like it will take 1000 minutes okay i already relate that uh i called 10 students so maybe i could say like let's go with the uh, five students okay i have a five students who are interested and to do this job for me okay like i called all the five students how can i distribute the same job to all the five students so what i would do is simply i will allocate 20 pages each and i will tell the same thing for all the five students like 1 to 20 i will give the first student and 21 to 40 i will give the second student 41 to 60 third student similarly i will give the remaining pages so i will tell the, all the five students you do work on in your 20 pages so obviously each student okay like um, five students i will hear the book as 20 20 pages each and then i'll give 20 pages to each student and then they'll come to the words since it is a 20 pages each so this entire five students they will complete in 200 minutes and then they will give me all the results 200 minutes what i will do is i will just combine all the i could they start counting at the same time they need not wait until one student get complete right 
So 1 to 20, one student will try to start, and 21 to 40, another student try, and 41 to 60, another student try, 61 to 80. Get this task into five students, so each student will complete just 200 minutes because each page will take only 10 minutes. So there are 20 pages each student. So if you come, the job will complete in 200 minutes. And finally, I will consolidate everything, all the results from all the five students, and then I need to sum it up all the count, right? So let's, uh, for example, let's assume that five minutes for consolidation. Consolidation of all the results and then compute total, total sum. So if I give this total job for five students, my total time taken for the complete job is 205 minutes. Agree? We could do that one. So if I have only single person, if I want to do myself, it will take 1000 minutes. So if you have the five students, I will distribute the, all the pages to all the, all the five students. So each student will get 20 pages and each student will take 200 minutes. And I will consolidate all the results for consolidation and then summing it up again, it may take another five minutes for me. And total time taken is 205 minutes, right? Just like you could tear the book and 20 pages and then you could do that one. If you need not do that page by page in sequence, right? To compute just like word and frequencies. Why you want to do that page by page? It's not required really. You could do that parallelly and then you can combine later on. Similarly, okay, like this is for five students. What would happen if I have 10 students? If I have the 10 students, Instead of 10, instead of 20 pages each, this time, since I have more students, I could give only 10 pages for each student, and for each student to complete 10 pages, it required only 10 minutes. For consolidation of, from all the 10 students, maybe let's take only the five minutes for consolidation. Consolidation for all the results from all the five sets. Here, if you have the 10 students, total time taken to do the job is just 105 minutes. Here, can, did you observe that? Did you observe the pattern? What is happening exactly? When you have more resources available to do your processing, your processing time is becoming shorter and shorter. What would happen if I have 10, students? I have only one page each. So each student will take only 10 minutes because each student has got only one page. Uh, maybe consolidation. Just for example, let's keep only the five minutes. Same as for other examples as well. Our total time here. Minutes. If they want to run the same job using single person, you should take 1000 minutes. Where is 1000 minutes? Where is 15 minutes? Right? So, here the key point is you need to divide the task such a way you could run. Each task independently from one to another, and they can run parallelly at the same time, and then you consolidate all the results. And if you have, if you are increasing your resources, There is a chance that you could complete this job in lesser time. Even when you say like, uh, instead of 100 pages book, even if you have 1000 pages book, and if you have more, 
So thousand thousand pages book that means you have more volume of the data. So if you increase the more resources, you could get complete in the same time. So this is how you could solve the big data challenge or big data problems using this kind of an architecture. But here the key point is you need to divide your job such a way so that you could run a part of the task independently from one to another. So here the each student, whatever he is doing at, at their level, Okay, like so here the each student is each student has taken like 200, uh, each student is taking like 200 minutes. This task is called mapper. So each student, whatever he, whatever the task that he is doing, is called like a mapper, and this consolidation task is called reducer. Okay. So if any any job. If you could be able to convert that into a map reduce program, then you could scale horizontally across the cluster. In other words, if you can be able to convert your job into a map reduce program, then you could run normally in the cluster. To run at the same time, whatever the formats of that one. By increasing the number of resources, you could be able to run it much more faster. So, when you are mapper and reducer parts, so you are system will give a better performance. Your system will allow you to easily okay, like this, uh, run the job much more faster and your performance will be much more higher, in other words. Okay, some of the echo. Anyway, so this is the one. Here the key point is, whatever the type of job, so if you could be able to run are convert into a map reduce, then you could run the map reduce program effectively into the cluster. And when you are increasing, uh, when you are increasing the size of the, when you are increasing your resources, okay, like you could be able to run much more faster. And then it will increase by increasing the degree of the parallelism, and then it will run multiple mappers at the same. Okay, so that is the high level. What is map reducer? Uh, somehow I'm not able to. Uh, maybe let me give a try. Okay. Is it clear now? Is it better? I just increase the font. So when you take the example, I think it's very easy to explain about map reduce. So here the key point is, if you could able to convert your job into a map reduce program, then you could run map reduce program effectively in a cluster in a much more faster and effective way. Okay. So there is a tool or a on the ecosystem which will be called as a peak. What this peak will do is Okay, like this pig tool, you could write a pig Latin script. You write a, some kind of a scripting language, and then this script language will be converted into a Java MapReduce program. So you write the code into the pig 
internally pig will converts into a java mapreduce program and since it is java mapreduce program you could run in the cluster of okay, like and then you could get the results in much more faster why the hadoop runs faster because it uses parallelism of okay, like by um, invoking more number of mappers at the same time and then it will finish the job in much more faster than traditional systems okay similarly there is a tool called hive so this hive what it does is you write the sql any sql statement which will be converted into a java map address so you may be wondering oh how can i divide in terms of the mapper in terms of the reduce how can i say that this is a this is a task which will be come under mapper this is the task which will come under reducer so that is very very uh, tedious or little bit complex to write our code if you know the sql you write the sql then hive will convert the sql statements into a java map reduce and then it will divide in terms of the mapper and reducer and then it will run that it will run in that cluster so if you don't know the sql if you know some of the scripting language like pig latin you write the pig latin code and which will be converted into java map reduce and then map reduce will run on the cluster so that is the fundamental uses of the stores both pig and also the hive so which will allow you to convert your uh, input statements into a java map reduce so once it is a map reduce you could run effectively the cluster here you could say like instead of five students i would say like five systems 10 students 10 system 100 students maybe 100 system and each system may have one or two or maybe more than five or 10 mappers are available so you have more degree of parallelism you could run more mappers at the same time and you could able to run this job much more shorter time This would be one of the reason why all your input data is divided in terms of the blocks. So here the block will be the minimum data that you could pass into one mapper. So if the input data size is 10 blocks, if there is a chance that you could invoke 10 mappers at the same time and read all the 10 blocks at the same, uh, same time and run read the entire file in much more faster way. So that is the advantage. So that, in other words, sometimes having super empty block size will help you out, okay, like to uh, have more number of mappers and then run uh, with that degree of parallelism. Okay. So that is a high level about uh, what is map reduce. Okay, what is mapper, what is reducer, and why it's called like a mapper reduce. Okay. And how this big and high tools will help you out uh, to convert the input statements into map reduce. We'll see more about that one whenever we are doing the big statements and high statements, and then you can see that much more, much more. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for joining this class. Okay, like and uh, for next time onwards, we'll be looking more towards our Java stuff. Okay. If you have any questions, please contact me and send me an email. Or use they will uh, pass that questions to me. Thank you and have a good day.